Good afternoon, uh, folks. My name is Michael Carroll. Um, and here I will stop sharing my screen for just a minute. Um, welcome to our uh, Supreme Court series in which we talk about intellectual property and tech law cases uh, that the court hears. And we do this on the afternoon of oral argument to quickly process uh, sort of our, our first take on, on what we learned at the oral argument. Today, we'll be talking about the case Twitter versus Tomna. And, um, um, and this is part of our ongoing series. Um, I'm going to uh, give a, a brief introduction of, to the law that's applicable in this case, the Anti-Terrorism Act as amended. Uh, I will then introduce our distinguished uh, panelists and we'll get off to our, our conversation. So, um, so we, as part of this series, we do have some upcoming events. Uh, we have two trademark cases involving trademark extraterritoriality and and the legal standard for uh, parodic uh, speech in in the in commerce, and then we have a patent case coming up. Um, okay. So the applicable law in this case is the Anti-Terrorism Act, which you can find at 18 U.S.C. 22. Uh, I messed that up. Um, there's a little bit of terminology that we need. Um, so ATA, as the panelists will use it, are, is talking about the Anti-Terrorism Act of 1990, which has been amended. Um, you will hear the term Halberstam. Halberstam is a case that was interpreting that act. Um, uh, or earlier, uh, an earlier case that set up a legal framework uh, for setting up legal, uh, for secondary liability, aiding and abetting liability. And you will hear the term JASTA, the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, which amends the ATA to codify the Halberstam uh, framework. So um, in particular, it was, uh, there was a different amendment. This is 1996. Uh, that added um, a, a liability for providing quote unquote material support or resources. That is not our case, but you will hear compare and contrast comments about the material support form of liability and what we're going to talk about, which is the substantial assistance uh, form of liability. Um, so it starts uh, section uh, 2333A allows US nationals uh, to bring a case if they've been injured by reason of an act of international terrorism uh, and they can receive treble damages. So civil action for a terrorist act that, uh, that causes injury. Uh, there's no explicit secondary liability, um, um, but we have this uh, Halberstam um, uh, common law standard um, and, and under this framework, uh, JASTA then uh, incorporated it. So um, JASTA adds section D, that's uh, really the focus of, of the conversation today. Um, and there it is. So now you memorized it, you know it, right? Okay, let's, let's make it a little easier. What, what, what is the law that Twitter has been uh, alleged to have violated? Uh, they are a person who is alleged to have aided and abetted by knowingly providing substantial assistance to uh, and or conspires with uh, the person who committed such act of international terrorism, right? So those are the elements of the claim. Um, and we'll be hearing a fair amount about what aids and abets means. We'll hear about what knowingly means, what, what it means to provide substantial assistance, um, and some focus about the, what it means uh, in, in relation to the person who commits such an act of, of terrorism. Um, now, just that Halberstam case makes life simple. I'm kidding. It's a three-part standard, right, uh, for secondary liability. You have to be generally aware of, of the role in this tortious activity, um, and you must knowingly and substantially assist the principal violation. How do you substantially assist? There's a six part test. So if you go back to JASTA, one of the elements is providing substantial assistance. And you will hear about these six factors as being relevant to what it means to provide uh, substantial assistance. So there will be a quiz at the end of this event. So I hope you've uh, memorized all of that. I'm kidding. 
Uh, and with that, um, I now uh, turn it, uh, I will introduce our, our speakers. Um, and, and I'll do this in alphabetical order. So uh, Keith Altman is the founder of K Altman Law, a national law firm that specializes in student defense and complex litigation matters. Uh, he is a, a, a attorney for the respondents in this case uh, and admitted to federal courts in California, Michigan, Maryland, as well as the US Court of Appeals and the United States Supreme Court. Um, he is a member of a, a variety of professional associations involved with e-discovery litigation um, and has uh, appeared before the Federal Rules Committee. And so civil litigation is his home territory. Um, Jacqueline Cooper is a senior counsel at Sidley Austin uh, and fought the, um, uh, her team filed a brief for the plaintiffs, the general committee and the MDL addressing the attacks of September 11th. Um, there, Amicus Curie uh, also supporting the respondents. Um, she's a member of Sidley's Supreme Court and Appellate Practice Group and practices primarily in civil, constitutional, and regulatory litigation with an emphasis on the constitutional, administrative, and telecommunications law. Um, Claire Chung is an attorney at Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hill and Door. Uh, they are counsel for the petitioner. Um, and her practice focuses on appellate matters in government and regulatory litigation. Ms. Chung has extensive experience litigating in a wide variety of substantive areas, including administrative law, constitutional law, intellectual property law, and the Anti-Terrorism Act and the Communications Decency Act, both of which are at issue in this case. Um, Emma Lonzo is the director of CDT's Free Expression Project, where she works to promote law and policy that support internet users' free expression rights in the, in the United States, Europe, and around the world. Emma's work spans many subjects, including human trafficking, privacy and online harassment, online child safety, terrorist propaganda, and disinformation. Um, so she works in particular on the capabilities and limitations of machine learning techniques and other forms of automation and content moderation and the analysis of, of online speech. Um, and Steve Vladek is a law professor at the University of Texas Law School. And I will mention that he used to be uh, on the American University of the School of Law uh, faculty. Um, and he holds the Charles Allen Wright Chair in federal courts at the University of Texas uh, School of Law. He's a nationally recognized expert on federal courts, constitutional law, national security law, and military justice. He is the counsel for, of record for the brief of the Anti-Terrorism Act scholars as uh, Amici Curiae uh, in support of the respondent. Um, and he's argued over a dozen cases before the US Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court and various uh, lower uh, federal civilian and military courts. Uh, so welcome to all of you. Uh, we're so delighted that you were able to uh, join us. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is ask the, uh, uh, our speakers to briefly tell us about the arguments that they presented uh, to the court in their briefs so that you have a context for the argument and then we'll really focus on the argument. And I'll start with parties counsel. So Mr. Altman, just uh, briefly, uh, why do you take the position that Twitter is, is responsible for aiding and abetting uh, in this case? Well, when you look at what the <clears throat> aiding and abetting statute says, if you provide help to a terrorist organization and that terrorist organization uh, engages in terroristic co uh, conduct, you can be held accountable for that conduct, even if you don't know what that specific conduct is going to be at the time you provided the support. Uh, I don't think Congress can, I don't think Congress could have been more clear in their directive, don't help terrorists. And if you do, we're going to, you know, you're going to expose yourself to liability. And if you look at the, the preface to JASTA, which is the modification, um, it says the purpose is to provide civil litigants with the broadest possible basis uh, of recovery consistent with the Constitution of the United States. And interestingly, it doesn't say Constitution of the United States and the laws of the United States. It limits it just to the Constitution. And so it's our perspective that because Twitter and other organizations knowingly allowed ISIS and other terrorist organizations to use their platform to recruit, radicalize, and raise money, they have made themselves subject to potential liability. 
Now, this is not a strict liability uh, perspective. Uh, clearly, they have to, you know, there are various the, the Halberstam factors, which I'm sure will be discussed at, at nauseum. Um, you know, set forth what is the framework for assessing uh, this kind of liability. But the bottom line is that when you go through the Halberstam factors, you can see that uh, Twitter is responsible for supporting, for providing material support to ISIS and therefore should be held accountable. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so Ms. Chung, you have a different perspective. Uh, what, what is, what's the position that Twitter took in this case? Um, so yes, um, we have three primary arguments, two on the sort of questions presented and one on the overarching policy reasons why our reading of the statute is correct. So on the sort of act, what I call the act requirement or the object of a defendant's assistance, we think that to be liable for aiding and abetting under section 2333D, a defendant must aid and abet the act of international terrorism that injured the plaintiff and that gave rise to the claim, not ISIS general terrorism enterprise or general course of conduct, as plaintiffs argue, and the Ninth Circuit held the level. Here, plaintiffs have unambiguously conceded that the act of international terrorism, they allege, is the RAIN attack. And so they have to assist, they have to allege that defendants substantially assisted the RAIN attack, and there's no allegation to that effect. Um, we think our reading of the statute is supported by the statutory text and context, as well as the underlying common law principles, including the Halberstam case that you just introduced. Um, on the statutory text, it plainly focuses on the injury causing act, the act of international terrorism. That becomes all the more clear when you compare it to the material support statute, which you also introduced. That provision, which is section 2339B, uh, makes it a crime to knowingly provide substantial assistance to a foreign terrorist organization. So if Congress had wanted to impose civil aiding and abetting liability for substantially assisting ISIS or ISIS's enterprise, it would have used language similar to the, to the one in the material support statute, but it did not. It, it used the act of international terrorism. And so that difference must be given effect. Um, the common law principles, including the Halberstam case, also support our reading. All of those cases discuss how to be liable for aiding and abetting the defendant must substantially assist the principal violation or principal tort. And the only actionable tort under the statute is the act of international terrorism. On the knowledge piece, which is an independent requirement under the statute, the statute says a defendant must knowingly provide substantial assistance. And so knowingly modifies both the word provi provide and the word substantial. So in our view, that means a defendant must knowingly undertake conduct that in fact substantially assisted the act of international terrorism. And the, or in our view, that's the RENA attack and according to plaintiffs that, um, that may be ISIS's general enterprise. And the defendant must also know that its conduct would substantially assist. Um, there are a few things about this case that are particularly notable in understanding what that means here. One is defendants in this case operate ordinary communication services that are used by billions of people around the world. They're not alleged to have provided atypical services or bespoke services that are tailored to terrorists. Two is plaintiffs acknowledge that defendants had policies in place that prohibited terrorist use of their platforms and regularly enforced those policies by removing ISIS accounts and posts. And three, plaintiffs, while plaintiffs allege that defendants were generally aware that ISIS was generally misusing their services, they do not identify any particular ISIS accounts and posts that constituted substantial assistance. So when you consider all of those together, their theory is really that defendants should be liable because of their purported inaction or failure to do more to remove these ISIS accounts and posts. Um, and in these circumstances, to have the requisite knowledge under the statute, these defendants must have known the particular ISIS accounts and posts that substantially assisted, in our view, the RENA attack. And they must have known that 
not removing those accounts and posts would substantially assist an attack. And plaintiff's allegations fail both prongs. Um, I, the third argument, we have a final argument on the policy reasons. It, we, as we explained in our brief, adopting the Ninth Circuit's reading would lead to practical harms for or ordinary businesses and humanitarian organizations. And for this argument, and I think for the case generally, it's important to sort of take a step back and think about just how expansive the scope of liability would be under plaintiff's reading. I mean, they're, they're alleging that defendants should be liable because of their purported failure to do more to prevent or remove ISIS accounts and posts. But something like 5,700 tweets are posted per second and 500 hours of YouTube videos are posted per minute. And so it may not be practically feasible to remove every harmful content on these services. And it, it, it cannot possibly be the case that defendants are liable every time there's harm arising from some content that remained on these services. And that's, that's not the law that Congress intended. That's not what Section 2333D says. And so that's why we should prevail. Great, thank you. Um, so Ms. Cooper, uh, you're, you're uh, a friend of the court and you, you took a different view. What, what's the position that you presented to the court? Yeah, so I worked on an amicus brief um, on behalf of the 9-11 victims filed in support of the respondents who were the uh, plaintiffs below. Um, and our view was that the Ninth Circuit correctly uh, decided the case and allowed this complaint to move forward. I think it's important that this case was decided on a motion to dismiss. So it was simply, there was simply a complaint where they decided it can go forward. We don't have a record. Uh, we don't even have an answer to the complaint. We don't have, there was no discovery. So the question is whether the allegations were um, sufficient. We, we think they were. Um, just as by the 9-11 the victims um, are in this case, the reason why they filed an amicus brief is because they're actively litigating a, uh, ATA aiding and abetting claims in multi-district litigation that's currently in the central uh, uh, Southern District of New York. Um, the plaintiffs in that case are the, the families of the people that were killed, uh, the people that were injured, um, and people that had property damage. Um, in the 9-11 attacks. The defendants in our litigation are individuals and entities, a lot, including a lot of banks and financial institutions and uh, foreign sovereigns and um, charitable organizations, purported charitable organizations that provided some sort of support to Al-Qaeda enabled them to do the attacks. Um, the, there are the social media companies like Twitter, uh, Facebook, Google are not defendants in our case. They didn't exist um, at the time of the uh, 2001 attacks. So um, they're not, uh, they are not defendants um, in our case. But the reason that um, our clients wanted to file an amicus brief here is because the uh, Anti-Terrorism Act is an act of uh, statute of general applicability and so obviously, whatever the court says here about the scope of the ATA and how you state a claim under the APA, ATA and what the standards are will obviously impact um, a lot of different um, kinds of industries. And so we're here to sort of say, um, however you think about this in the context of social media, please be aware of the larger context and other sorts of other sorts of cases. We made two specific points in our brief, there's really two ways in which we sort of disagree with Twitter. Um, the first point is we don't think that an ATA plaintiff has to show that there's a direct nexus to um, the particular terrorist attack at issue. We think that the stating a cause of action means uh, showing support for the terrorist organization such as um, Al Qaeda. And we, we make various arguments. We think the text supports us we think that the Halberstam case supports us. In fact, we think under Twitter's position, it has to be wrong because the Halberstam case would have turned out the other way. Um, we also think, we also note that the Second Circuit has basically rejected um, Twitter, Twitter's position and the Second Circuit and the DC Circuit have probably decided more, more cases on this than anyone else. Um, as far as the text, one other point I would make is that you know, the, the, the parties have a lot of discussion about whether the object of aiding and abetting in the statute is the 
um, act or the party who did the act. And, and, and our view was actually that the Ninth Circuit was correct either way. And the reason we think that is because in our view, when Congress passed JASTA, in its view, um, providing support to a terrorist organization that's been designated by the United States as a terrorist organization is sort of tantamount to providing support to particular acts. The terrorist organizations that have been designated by the United States um, are, their, their sole purpose is to conduct um, terrorist acts. So providing support to them um, is providing support um, to particular terrorist acts because those acts are the natural and foreseeable consequence of providing support to them. And the final second point in our brief is simply, we feel that Twitter, um, there's the Halberstam is the legal framework that applies. And we figure, feel, feel that it is the framework that kind of answers these questions. And that we saw a lot in their Twitter's briefing kind of arguing we felt for that the standard should be, the standard would require a higher showing in particular circumstances or maybe even safe harbors like for um, companies that provide routine or widely available services um, or companies that um, provide, that did, didn't deal directly with the terrorists and those types of things. And in, in our view, we, we saw, or companies that act, are, the, the allegation is inaction rather than action. And our view is that while those things make a lot of sense to Twitter, that we, they, they don't need to be, they shouldn't be grafted as requirements um, for the legal test because that would affect a lot of other people and would, we feel, get a lot of other terrorists off the hook, um, banks and other organizations for, um, for terrorism. So that's our view. Great, thank you. Um, and staying uh, on this side of the case for a minute, Professor Vladek, you filed also in support of uh, respondents. As, uh, and so why, and uh, what do you think uh, Twitter's got wrong in, in its uh, reading of the statute? Sure, <clears throat> um, so I filed on behalf of a group of Anti-Terrorism Act scholars. We've actually been filing a series of amicus briefs in just about every big JASTA case in the lower courts and now in the Supreme Court. Um, largely to help provide context and background for JASTA. Um, and I think it might be helpful to say a word about that here. Um, so first, JASTA was not enacted out of the blue. JASTA amends the ATA in response to a series of lower court decisions, including in some of the cases involving Jacqueline's clients, um, where lower courts had adopted, in our view, unduly narrow interpretations of the original Anti-Terrorism Act. So, you know, when folks talk about, well, if Congress had meant to do X or if Congress really wanted to do Y, um, there's no question that Congress meant to do this. Congress was reacting to lower court decisions that had narrowed liability in many of the same ways that Twitter is arguing to narrow liability in this case. And part of why I think that's really important is because even if you're not one who cares about the context of these statutes, which we recount in our amicus brief, you know, the text of the statute expressly incorporates Halberstam. Um, as Eric Schnapper, I think, put it quite helpfully today, this is not a fight over a common law rule. This is a fight over a statute statutory rule that incorporates a common law rule. And so in that regard, I think it's helpful to say a word about Halberstam, which you know we're 25 minutes in and haven't actually described. Um, in Halberstam, right, the DC Circuit, this remarkable panel with judges Wald, Bork, and Scalia um, unanimously held that Linda Hamilton could be held secondarily liable both for aiding and abetting and conspiring with a guy named Welch in his murder of David, of David Halberstam, um, even though Hamilton had no knowledge of the murder, even though she had no intent to commit the murder. Her only knowledge was of the fact that Welch was involved in a criminal enterprise. Um, and even with that knowledge and with the substantial assistance she provided through bookkeeping and other routine business activities, that was enough for that panel to hold that she was liable under secondary liability principles of common law. So Michael, against that backdrop, you know, Twitter's three arguments. First, the notion that the defendant has to aid and abet the specific act of international terrorism. Um, Halberstam literally says the opposite. Halberstam says the defendant has to have, quote, a general awareness of her role in a continuing criminal enterprise. Um, right. So if the argument is that JASTA doesn't actually codify Halberstam, that's one thing. But if the argument is that JASTA codifies Halberstam and requires that Hamilton have known that Welch was involved in murder 
and not just in a general enterprise of criminal thefts of property. Um, that's, I think, why Jacqueline says, right? You'd have to think Halberst you have to think Halberstam was would come out the other way. Um, to the notion that the knowledge that the defendant must have knowledge that the individual's assistance must be substantial. Um, again, Halberstam doesn't say that. At no point did the panel suggest that Linda Hamilton had to know how much her assistance was facilitating Welch's criminal enterprise. All she had to know was that she was facilitating Welch's criminal enterprise and the assistance itself had to be substantial. Um, and then to that question about substantial services, right? Um, Twitter makes a big deal out of the idea that ordinary communication services can't be substantial. Um, well, I don't see how that's consistent with Halberstam. The services Hamilton provided were bookkeeping and other what we would think of as routine um, I don't know, logistical services for a criminal enterprise, but services that were nevertheless themselves at least innocuous at first blush. Um, there's also, I think, no action or inaction distinction in Halberstam. Halberstam specifically punts on that question in a footnote. And so I think, you know, if we're actually being faithful to Halberstam itself, it's kind of hard to actually put this case on the other side of Halberstam. And so unless we think that Josta doesn't really incorporate Halberstam, which is a different argument, I think there are real problems for Twitter's position. Um, finally, and just really briefly, as to the policy arguments to which Claire alluded, you know, I think those arguments are actually quite strong. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that when Congress passed the statute, it was thinking of activities like the ones that the plaintiffs in this case are seeking to hold Twitter liable for. The problem is that Congress expressly adopted Halberstam. And so insofar as there are policy objections to adopting such a capacious framework for secondary liability, those strike me as arguments for Congress and not for the courts. Um, and just the last thing I'll say about the sort of the interorum argument that under the Ninth Circuit's approach, every single time there's any harm, um, a company like Twitter could be held liable. No, I mean, that's where the substantial part of substantial assistance really have to do some work. And so I think it's pretty meaningful in this context that Twitter was not just providing one-off facilitation um, through, the, through the existence of a single post, but that Twitter knew for a long time that it was that its its platform was being used by ISIS, how its platform was being used by ISIS, the volume of content that was being uh, uh, distributed through Twitter. So, you know, we might all have different views about exactly where the line is for substantial assistance. Um, and I think Halberstam does have a little bit of wiggle room on that. But to me, that's really where the fight is. Was Twitter's assistance substantial under Halberstam? Because just about all the other arguments strike me and strike the amici who I represent as really basically suggesting that Halberstam itself either comes out the wrong way or at least shouldn't have been fully incorporated into JASTA the way that the statute says it was. Great, thanks. Um, and last but not least, Ms. Lonzo, uh, you uh, supported Twitter, um, so you have a different view. Why and, and who did you represent? Yes, thank you so much. <clears throat> and I'll try to be brief because I'm sure there's a lot more that we want to discuss, but uh, Center for Democracy and Technology filed a brief on behalf of ourselves, the American Civil Liberties Union and National and the ACLU of Northern California, Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University, the R Street Institute and Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, um, which might tip you off to the kinds of arguments we were making in our brief, which were all about how there are not just policy arguments, but constitutional arguments stemming from the First Amendment standards applied to uh, intermediary liability for distributors of third-party speech about why um, the ATA and the Halberstam factors should not be interpreted to allow for liability when an online service provider has general awareness of the fact that ISIS is using its service and in fact needs to be much more like specific knowledge of a particular post and knowledge that that will uh, provide substantial support to an act of international terrorism. Um, so in our brief, we uh, we cover some of the history um, and the First Amendment doctrine around uh, what happens when um, liability is imposed on speech intermediaries and explaining how that can chill speech and everything from um, bookstores to online service providers uh, and really try to help the court understand that there is a, a doctrine of law to understand that we have treated speech and speech intermediaries differently under our law because of the First Amendment in a variety of different contexts um, and really trying to recognize what is going to happen to individual speech, user speech. I'm not even really focused on the speech of the people um, who are whose speech is potentially supporting ISIS, but all of the other speech 
of, of speakers online that is going to get swept up when online service providers take action on a general awareness standard or a general knowledge standard to try to keep anything referencing terrorism off of their services. Um, so in our brief, we talk through um, the, the likelihood that there would be substantial chilling of lawful constitutionally protected speech by people who have nothing to do with terrorism, but who are doing things like reporting on terrorism, advocating against terrorism, um, explaining the history behind uh, particular terrorist attacks, and a lot of other kinds of speech. Um, and we try to talk through how and why this happens and give the court a little bit of technical detail and background into how content moderation on online services actually works, what happens when they are trying to avoid hosting a, a broad category of content like content relating to terrorism and how, especially through the use of automated tools um, and filtering technologies, the likelihood that over broad uh, removal of lawful and constitutionally protected speech is really quite high. Um, and we also explained to the court how the uh, one of the most relevant sort of examples in the online speech perspective um, of this case, which is the amendment that Congress passed in 2018 to Section 230, which is not directly at issue in the Tomna case, but it is at issue in the Gonzalez case. Um, uh, that amendment was the law FOSTA SESTA, which was focused around um, changing the, the federal law around uh, online child trafficking, but which ended up as a law that created a new risk of federal liability for online services who promote or facilitate prostitution. This was a vague standard. Um, it's currently being litigated as CDT is an amicus in that case as well um, and challenged on constitutional grounds. But the upshot was that when Congress changed the uh, changed federal law to create a significant liability risk or perception of significant liability risk for online service providers around content relating potentially to po prostitution, the response from online services was to be very overbroad in the content that they took down um, to chill a lot of lawful speech. Uh, and that that is the kind of thing that we can anticipate from a um, broad and unclear liability standard based on kind of general awareness and indeed steps that an online service provider is taking to remove terrorist content from their service. So we provided this as kind of context and, and background to the court. I will say the court did not really talk about these issues at all. Um, barely mentioned speech in the case today. Uh, and there was one glancing reference to the First Amendment. Um, but that was the, the kind of broader context and the potential implications of the decision in this case that we were trying to um, make clear to the court. Great. Um, so yeah, we, we had very uh, brief uh, statements of their case by, by counsel at, at argument. They then asked, they welcomed the justices questions and there were a lot of questions. Um, so uh, we heard about pagers, we heard about guns, banks. Uh, and so I think the, the uh, Ms. Cooper's point about this is not a social media case, this is a more generally applicable statute, that, that appeared to land pretty clearly. Um, so let me let the parties uh, comment first and then and then I'll ask others for sort of what are the moments in the argument that stuck out uh, as, as most uh, significant to you? And so Mr. Altman, what how do you, what kind of day do you think you had? what what did you hear that that struck stuck with you the most? Well, in terms of what kind of day we had, I don't know the Supreme Court will let us know. I think anybody that thinks they know what they're going to do here is just, you know, shooting in the dark. But as far as some of the, the stuff that took place today, certainly the First Amendment reference kind of caught me off guard. Uh, it was not something I was necessarily expecting to hear. Um, didn't really get explored very much. Um, it, it seems to me that a clear battle was uh, the questioning over whether, once again, they had to know of the specific incident at play or just general help to the organization. I think ultimately that's a, a key question that the court's going to have to decide uh, in, in this context. I think that there was uh, certainly much concern over whether there had to be an actual uh, they had to know about the actual event. Did Twitter need to know about Raina uh, in order to be held accountable? Of course, it's our position that they didn't need to know that, and I think that's consistent with uh, previous law. But it was clear that the court was really 
focusing their questions on that kind of distinction. Where do you draw? Where do you draw the line? Where is? Uh, uh, how do you provide guidance to an organization of just what they need to do? Um, one thing that is clear and I think was a little bit confusing. This is not simply an example of where uh, Twitter didn't do anything in response to the knowledge that they had. I, I think this is, you know, the, they did actual steps, making recommendations, uh, trying to promote uh, ISIS-based content. It's our position that if not for the social media companies, ISIS would be 50 guys standing around a fire in the desert, jumping up and down, and that would be the extent of ISIS. But, uh, you know, and, and given social media's support and the ability for them to recruit, radicalize, and raise money is what allowed ISIS to become the organization that it is today. Uh, without social media, it just would have had no reach. And, and I don't think we would be seeing the kind of issues that you saw. So a, a, as far as the court goes, I, I think that's the biggest decision that the court's going to need to make. Is does it require the potential offender to know of the specific event? And I think a lot of the questions just really focused uh, on that particular aspect of it. The other stuff will work itself out, I think, once you establish just what needs to be uh, just how far they need to know. Um, I, I think everything else will kind of fall into place at that point. Okay. Um, and Ms. Chun, for you? So just on the point that um, Keith mentioned, I, I just want to clarify, as, as Seth did at oral argument, our position is not that Twitter or any defendant had to know about the Reina attack. I was talking on the first part of the argument, I was talking about sort of the act piece, so independent of knowledge. To what defendants, plaintiffs must allege the defendant substantially assisted the Reina attack. That is separate from what Twitter had to know. And uh, that argument is what I explained earlier. Um, I also want to um, sort of address the recommendation aspect because it came up yesterday in the Gonzalez argument. It came up briefly today at argument. Recommendate, I mean, there are a lot of paragraphs in the, in the complaint, the amended operative complaint. Very few paragraphs are about recommendations. If you look at the Tamna portion of the Ninth Circuit's decision, the, the court doesn't even mention recommendations. The plaintiff's core theory, as this case has been litigated so far, is that defendants should be held liable because they could have done more to prevent or remove ISIS accounts and posts. That's why inaction comes into play. That's why, as the government explained in its brief and oral argument, remoteness of services comes into play. So with those two clarifications, um, one thing that I thought was uh, interesting was it seemed that several justices were concerned about sort of the practical implications of a broad reading of the statute. I think at one point, one of the justices asked, and I'm just paraphrasing at this point from my recollection, asked whether under a plaintiff's theory that a defendant needs to assist only ISIS's general enterprise, under that theory, whether these defendants would be liable for uh, essentially every attack that ISIS committed. And I think Mr. Schnapper um, ultimately said yes. And I think that illustrates the broad scope of liability that's at stake here. There was a, some discussion about Halberstam. Um, and we think that Halberstam supports our reading. So on the enterprise point, it's true that the DC Circuit used the word enterprise, but it did so in a factual descriptive sense to describe a number of burglaries that Mr. Welch had committed. And it was absolutely the case that Ms. Hamilton aided and abetted every single one of the burglaries that uh, Mr. Welch committed. I mean, the facts of Halberstam are completely different from the allegations here. And that much the Ninth Circuit, even the Ninth Circuit acknowledged. Ms. Hamilton knew about smelting furnace in the garage where they would you know, smelt the stolen goods and turn them into personal wealth. She performed record keeping, bookkeeping, secretarial services that turned stolen goods into personal wealth. So there was a one-on-one -on -one transaction. She was not operating routine business services as someone mentioned. She was a live-in partner to Mr. Welch. They lived together. And as part of that 
relationship. She was a willing partner, and I believe the Ninth Circuit, uh, the DC Circuit, used that phrase. She was a willing partner in Mr. Welch's criminal activities. So she absolutely, affirmatively, and knowingly, substantially assisted every one of the burglaries, including the one that led to the murder. So the court held that she was liable for aiding and abetting the burglary, which is the principal violation in that case. And as a result, is also aiding, uh, liable for aiding and abetting the murder, which was a foreseeable consequence of the burglary, nighttime property crime. So we think Halberstam actually supports our reading. And I believe, I think it was Justice Jackson who was asking this line of questions. Um, and she she kind of get at this, got at the same point and she teased this out a little bit more. And her line of question suggested that she, Ms. Hamilton did assist, substantially assist the burglaries, not a broad amorphous concept of an enterprise that is independent of the individual burglaries at issue. Um, I feel like I talked a lot, so I would just stop okay. here. All right, well, well, you'll get another shot, but how about Ms. Cooper, <laughs> what, which moments uh, stuck out for you? Well, I thought it was I thought it was a really interesting argument, um, and I would I, I couldn't possibly predict how it will come out, um, other than to say that I, I could see a lot of you know split dis, or different opinions on both sides. I think one thing the court struggled with, first of all, I do think they very much got um, the notion that um, that too broad an application of the Anti Terrorism Act would create problems for the social media companies. Um, they were very concerned about the possibility of like uh, Pandora's box of liability on these companies. On the other hand, I very much thought they took some of the points like for example, that we are, think are important that recognizing that sort of too narrow a scope on the Anti-Terrorism Act um, would, would not provide relief um, for people that are maybe suing banks um, as we are um, and other um, entities that um, are fallouts you know, outside the social media context. So they very much understood, I think, as Professor Bladick indicated that Congress in JASTA very much wanted to expand, expand um, and provide a robust um, aiding and abetting um, cause of action. So I thought a lot of sort of the justices asking questions where I think they're trying to figure out how do we resolve, this case is on a motion to dismiss, there's always often sort of um, choices they make about how broadly they decide a case. Um, do they issue an opinion that's very much just about the facts in front of them and whether Twitter's, um, whether the complaint is adequate against Twitter? Do they attempt to establish a rule rules that will guide future cases? I mean, they take, they take cases because they want to provide guidance. I think they're not quite sure how to do that here. Um, there were a bunch of questions, for example, Justice Sotomayor asked um, Twitter's counsel and the government, you tell me what the rule is that you want us to say. And the answers to me came back was like basically describing their case. Like they would say, you can't state an aided betting claim when you provide routine services to a wide variety of audiences and you have a policy in place. Um, and the allegations that you didn't do more and you didn't help the particular, it, it was like this very long answer that was like, and then prompted just to saw you to my or say, so you you want to, this is a one, this is a one case ruling or something like you just want us to rule on your case. Um, and the same similar thing when they asked, she or somebody asked the, the government's attorney, Ed Miller, what rule do you want? Um, and they kind of pointed out that the government in its brief on the very last page of its brief also had a rule that was like in the following eight circumstances, which are the circumstances of this quick case. And, you know, like if you're and if your name is Twitter, then you're then you're not liable to the um, the anti-terrorism act. And I think that they were just like, well, we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, so what what are we going to do? So I, I can't predict how they're going to come out, but that's kind of the way I saw their their debate. And, and it, my final comment was just maybe just pulling back a little bit having listened a little bit to some of, of yesterday's argument in Gonzalez, which addressed a, um, an issue about immunity, I think the justices were a whole lot more comfortable today with deciding the case that's in front of them. What I saw yesterday was there are numerous points where they were just like, like uh, uh, we, we, you know, this is a pre-internet um, pre a pre statute that we're trying to figure out how it maps onto um, inter, you know, internet services that con Congress never considered. I'm not sure we're in a position to do that institutionally. I'm not sure that 
you know, we're, we're not the right people to answer that question. Maybe Congress should figure this out. Whereas today, I felt like they were just much more comfortable. They were in the heartland of, we're interpreting a statute. This is a motion to dismiss. We're trying to figure out how much guidance we could be provide, but I, I felt like they felt like they're comfortable with that. I don't know what that, I don't know exactly the relationship to the cases, if that means they're going to decide this on one ground rather than the other, but that was just an observation that I had. Yeah, I, I share that very much. Uh, Professor Vladek, what, what, what did you take away? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that that last point's a really important one. I mean, this is much more, I think, their their comfort zone than yesterday. And I think that's actually a problem for the folks on my side because the way to make, you know, there are two ways to make yesterday's case go away. Um, mm -hmm. One is to dig it, to dismiss it as improvidently granted, which is to me the better option here. Um, and the other is to actually just decide this case and then vacate and remand Gonzalez in light of the decision in this case. But that would only work if they reverse the Ninth Circuit um, on the scope of aiding and abetting liability. And then the question is whether that also knocks out the claims against Google and Gonzalez such that you don't even have to reach the 230 immunity question. Um, the problem with that, and I think that was floated yesterday by Justice Barrett, and I think it came back up a bit to today, is that it incentivizes the court to basically depart from the statute's text where I actually think that one of the reasons why today is an easier case is because the statute is clearer as to exactly what the court's job is in this context. And just to sort of, you know, to beat the dead horse on Halberstam one more time, you know, Claire and I must read different versions of the Federal Reporter because I don't recall any, any point in Halberstam where Judge Wald says Hamilton was liable for each and every one of Welch's burglaries. Um, I think the point was that she was liable for the general criminal enterprise that she knew Welch was involved in without knowing any more specifics. So I think one of the things that came up a lot of argument today, one of the things I think is important to keep in mind as we talk about this case is the knowledge question, right? The Halberstam Sienter requirements are a bit of a mush. Um, but if the question is, do you actually have to know that you're specifically facilitating particular acts of international terrorism? I just I don't recall any point where Judge Wald says how ha Hamilton's liable because she knew she was facilitating the burglary of this house or that house. Um, indeed, ha Hamilton didn't even know that she was facilitating burglaries per se. Um, so I guess I just you know I come back to the notion that Halberstam, for better or for worse is a remarkably capacious opinion. And we might disagree with Congress's decision to incorporate that into the statute. But again, I mean, part of the issue is the kinds of arguments that Twitter and the top side of Mickey are arguing for are a return to some of the uh, pre-JASTA approaches that precipitated JASTA in the first place. Um, the leading pre-JASTA case on secondary liability under the Anti-Terrorism Act is a case called BOEM-3 from the so, Seventh Circuit. But can I just, we yeah. want to hear about the justice since they get the power to decide yes. this. So, right. but, the merits so, so, all, so, so all I was trying to say, Michael, is that I think one of the things that I think didn't come up enough at the argument, and that I think is a pretty b important bellwether for where this is going, is there wasn't discussion of the pre-JASTA landscape. And there wasn't discussion of the pre-JASTA decisions that JASTA was specifically intended to overrule. And so against that backdrop, I think, you know, yes, anyone who's really confident about the outcome um, doesn't know what they're talking about. But the notion that this is a court that's in a hurry to affirm, I think, is hard to square with what we heard today. Okay. Uh, Ms. Lonzo. Yes. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, so it was Justice Kavanaugh who led to the discussion of the first, or the, the brief mention of the First Amendment um, by raising the example of uh, in 1997, CNN conducted an interview with Osama bin Laden, um, and this interview, you know, gave a big platform at the time to Osama bin Laden. That interview became um, a tool that was used in recruiting. Um, and he he asked the counsel for the respondent, you know, could CNN be sued for um, aiding and abetting the 9/11 attacks by kind of in 97 giving this initial bump and promotion and um, much wider distribution to Osama bin Laden's uh, speech and, and commentary and facilitating recruitment. And this is where counsel for the respondent did mention that, you know, had a, had a couple of ideas of where the Halberstam factors might not apply to CNN and Justice Kavanaugh seemed kind of skeptical. And, and the end of the interaction was just sort of, well, the First Amendment will solve that. And what I think is really important to recognize is that this 
like this case would be where and discussing what are the actual knowledge standards and what are the ways that we interpret these um, the the Halberstam factors as applied to speech intermediaries. This is where that should be those First Amendment questions should be coming into play. And they really weren't a major focus of the discussion. There are, haven't been a key aspect of um, kind of how the the litigation over this question has happened. And so I, I worry about the court making a decision on this because I very much understand um, other other counsel's concerns about turning JASTA, a statute of general applicability, into something that's not useful for many, many other kinds of aiding and abetting liability that might be out there. But I do think it's important for the court to understand, like, this is the time for the First Amendment consideration to happen. And, and we just didn't see much discussion of that. We got a little taste of that, maybe, um, from Justice Thomas asking if the uh, respondent's theory wouldn't mean that Twitter would effectively be open to aiding and abetting liability for any act of international terrorism committed by ISIS. If the if the idea is that they have failed to keep ISIS off of their service, if they're, the idea is that they have recommended content from ISIS to other parties, there's it, it seemed like the, there was some sort of recognition that there's not anything, that there's not much of a limiting principle here. And that because we know and because I think Twitter and other online services admit to and are engaged in lots of high profile activities trying to stop terrorist abuse of their their services, that that ends up meaning that there's potentially a lot of different claims that could be brought for effectively imperfect content moderation. Um, and that if we know anything about online content moderation, we know it's always going to be imperfect because of the scale of speech that's at issue um, because of the inability to review every piece of content uh, before it gets posted. So that that would be a really concerning outcome to me. And I saw little little bits of recognition of sort of some of the consequences on the speech side of things in the questions, but most of the discussion was about banking. And so I think that was a really interesting difference from yesterday's arguments in the Gonzalez versus Google case, where the justices couldn't stop themselves from wanting to talk about aiding and abetting liability. And, you know, to Jacqueline's point, they seemed much more comfortable on, you know, talking about these kinds of statutory interpretation issues rather than the Section 230 interpretation issues. And can I jump in on that? In particular, we have a former prosecutor in Justice Alito, for former uh, public defender in, in Justice Jackson, and, and aiding and abetting is, you know, a, a key criminal law center standard. So when Justice Alito expressed uh, um, frustration with knowingly as, as, you know, looking for a limiting principle um, and, and suggesting couldn't we, couldn't we interpret that as purposeful um, uh, and 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 Justice Jackson seemed open to that. I, I felt like that was a negotiation. Any comment? That seemed to me like I think Justice Sotomayor was sort of negotiating. Give me your holding as you would like it, and she offered that to uh, Mr. Waxman and 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 the government. And then there was this negotiation over uh, maybe limiting knowingly to uh, something closer to purposefully. And any reactions to that? part of the, the conversation? I guess I'll jump in. I, I had a reaction. I, I did think that was interesting in the same as, as Professor Carroll, as you indicate, maybe it was like a, I think they were trying to think out loud about how they think of these things. But part of my reaction was where would you get that from either the statutory text or Halberstam or anything any other court said. I mean, maybe you think that is a way to make, make sense of this, um, but I'm not, I'm not sure that Congress, uh, from my point of view, may, um, said that it's an element of a JASTA claim that you have to sort of have a purposeful alignment um, of your goals or any, you know, or, or anything like that. I think that they, they opened up, um, I, I just don't think, I think that would add an element to JASTA and I don't think that element is there. Um, and so that was, that was a little bit of a concern, but I respect their, their, you know, how they, how they, how they think about, about these things and their attempt, attempt to do that. Claire, I see you on in. So I was just going to say, so I think he said something like, what if we interpreted knowledge in the third element of Halberstam as like a shade short of purposefulness or intent? So I think the court is cognizant that the statute says knowledge, but the underlying instinct is that aiding, if you think about 
how aiding and abetting normally works. It, it's trying to get at the concept of culpability. And intent is often the way to get at that, to get at the culpable conduct. So I think that instinct is, is right and is reflected in the common law jurisprudence. And I, I understand that Halberstam didn't address inaction because Ms. Hamilton was like a classic aider or better. She affirmatively provided substantial assistance. But it does talk about, I think in footnote 14, uh, the common law cases that discuss the potential relevance of inaction. And if you look at those cases like Woodward from the Fifth Circuit, those cases discuss how absent a special duty owed to the plaintiff, which is not alleged in this case, um, usually aiding and abetting liability is not established based on mere inaction over the course of providing routine business transactions absent conscious intent. So intent is kind of in the background and we, we explained this in our briefing too. We recognize that the statute says knowledge. These cases say that scienter has to scale upward when a defendant is accused only of inaction or remote providing remote services. And so our way of sort of interpreting it is, is the way I've articulated in the beginning of this conversation, which is it requires knowing particular ISIS accounts and posts that in fact substantially assisted and knowing that failure to remove those accounts would substantially assist. Without that kind of knowledge, you simply don't have actual knowledge because again, defendants operate ordinary communication services that are used by billions of people around the world that was also allegedly misused by ISIS, contrary to their regular efforts to remove these accounts and posts. So that's how I think about the interaction between um, purposefulness and the knowledge standard. Can I say, I mean, quickly on, on the Woodward point, I mean, Woodward, Woodward doesn't say, though, that inaction can never be a basis for aiding and abetting liability. It says instead that, quote, the issue turns on the nature of the duty owed by the alleged aider and abetter to the other parties to the transaction. And so I think in this context, I'm not sure that the existence of terms of service actually helps Twitter's argument, because by that own argument, right, Twitter actually had an obligation to enforce its terms of service. Um, and to actually be aware of what it was doing. So, you know, I, I think we're not going to, I mean, we're all going to have to, I think, agree to disagree about whether Twitter really was um, uh, liable for inaction or for not acting in particular ways. I mean, this goes back to the common law distinction between malfeasance and misfeasance. Um, but I think the larger point is, this is all a quest to write a different statute. And it's a quest to write a statute that might make a lot of sense. It's a quest to make it to write a statute that if we were all in Congress, we, we might vote for. Um, but given that we're all supposed to be textualists now, I'm, you know, I continue to be surprised about the extent to which today's argument and conversations about it run away from the text and don't think that everything rises and falls on what we think would have been consistent with or not consistent with Halberstam. Well, I mean, Steve, let me stay with you for just a minute because we're we're about out of time. But but you, in addition to sort of being amicus in this case, you are also a, essentially a, a professional court watcher. So step back from your brief for a minute. <laughs> Forget about trying to <laughs> persuade us about your reading of JASTA and talk to me a little bit more about the court and, and how they think about their role in this case and what you took more uh, generally about what you would predict they would do if you're willing to go there. Sure. I mean, I, I think I've said this already, and I, I suspect this is probably not going to be something that controversial uh, among the, the folks on the, on the panel. I mean, I, I think the court is, I think today's argument is a really good example about how textualism is often um, used the way that the Scottish writer Andrew Lang said drunks use lampposts, right, for support, not for illumination, um, in the sense that, like, yes, you know, we're all textualists now, but sometimes that means we spend an hour talking or three hours talking about the statute Congress should have written um, and the, the statute that we wish Congress had written. I guess to me, Michael, it's actually a useful illustration of what most statutory interpretation actually is, um, a, a remarkably candid, right, interpretation of what most statutory interpretation actually is. And, you know, as, as someone who's not as sort of dogmatically committed to textualism, I don't have a problem with that. I think there's a lot to be said for this kind of purposivist approach to statutory interpretation. 
the two broader issues are that one, this is not what the court says it's supposed to be doing. And two, in JASTA, we have an unusually expressed statement from Congress of its purpose. So, you know, I think this is actually in many ways harkens back to, you know, the old school Supreme Court's approach to statutory interpretation, whether that's going to be how the opinion cashes out remains to be seen. But I think that's part of why I suspect we all came away from today's argument with the idea that the justices had a lot more fun today than they had yesterday. Yeah. And so I'll just ask, I mean, if counsel for the parties want to answer this question, you can, but they usually don't. But but for, you know, predictions on the, the lineup and, and who writes, anyone? How about I, a, yeah, I'll, a I'll say really quickly, I mean, I mean, one of the problems is that there are only six arguments in in February now because they dumped the Title 42 case. So we won't even be able to play the usual tea leaf reading about other opinions from this from the session because not everyone's going to get a majority opinion in the first place. Hmm. No one wants. To... I wondered Jack, if there was. I see you. I don't know, maybe I'm. Just Professor Blade, guys, do you think there's any possible outcome that's like a remand to allow the plaintiffs to replead or something? I wasn't sure if I, you know that that could be. I mean, I think that that um, yeah. the respondents were kind of inter interested in that yesterday, saying like, look, if you if you kind of come up with a new standard that's a little bit new, then you need to allow us to you know replead or something. Um, I mean, it's 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 possible. I, I guess. I mean, let me just say, like, assuming the court doesn't affirm, which I think is is probably the best bet, you know, um, in light of how the argument went today, you know, there's still presumably at least something for the Ninth Circuit to do on remand. Um, whether that something goes all the way toward giving the plaintiffs a chance to amend their complaint, um, you know, as as we as we mentioned earlier, this is really at such an early phase. It's at the motion to dismiss stage. Of, uh, stage. I could see that happening. Um, Right. I could also see the court, you know, actually saying, well, you know, we've changed the test. So Ninth Circuit, we want you to apply the test in the first instance, as opposed to us applying it to Twitter directly. Um, part of what Michael, part of why I think it's really hard to handicap this case in particular is because, you know, the argument was really substantive. And, and I think, you know, we heard the hard question, many of the hard questions from the justices in ways that weren't hand tipping. Um, so other than both Justice Barrett and at one point, Justice Alito basically asking, you know, either um, uh, Seth Waxman or Ed Needler, how do you want us to rule for you? Which I thought were probably pretty good clues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it's hard to guess. Is it going to be on knowledge? Is it going to be on substantial assistance? Is it going to be on some, you know, um, regular business activity specific rules? Is it going to be on the eight factor test that the SG proposed? It's those permutations that I think make it really hard to handicap both who's writing, what they're going to say, and to Jacqueline's point, what room would be left for any further proceedings on remand? Fair enough. I, I, I agree with that point. I mean, they did take three hours, but it was a very substantive. I, I it's a discussion slash negotiation is what I heard. There was a lot of sort of testing out about possible and, and a lot of quite a line needed to be needs to be drawn and a lot of possible places to draw the line. So and it's and and in the shadow of Gonzalez. I mean, I think I think again, like Gonzalez really looms over this because any inclination that the justices might have to avoid drawing that line in this context would require them to, you know, pucker up and decide Gonzalez. Yeah. So I just want to close with one other meta observation, which is sort of about the court as an institution and these people who have to come to work and work together. Um, and, you know, in the wake of something like the Dobbs decision, which uh, obviously, uh, you know, went not only the leak of the opinion, but the reaction within the court. Um, and then they have to get up the next day and work together on trying to piece together what a statute meant. I, there's something about this particular sort of complex case and they're working together at argument that struck me as, as sort of giving the court an ability to work more as a common, common enterprise. Like yesterday, they were commonly confused. And today they were really sort of working together on trying to articulate where the line you know, what their possible line might be. And and I, I don't know if anyone else saw that, but there was an element of collegiality that I, I felt was 
uh, maybe a little warmer than usual because of this sort of sense of shared enterprise on trying to solve the problem. Did anyone else get any of that? I would agree with that. I mean, I, I, one thing I saw is that they were they, they were dealing with complicated questions and they would often refer to each other's questions. They would say, well, I'd like you to go back to Justice Kagan's hypothetical. And I but you know, but, but Justice, um, you know, Justice um, Thomas asked this and I'd, I really like you to flesh that out. And it was like nine brains, just nine brains trying to focus on this. And you could tell that everybody sort of appreciated like you know, each person added, you know, added, illuminated something through, through a hypothetical or something else. Um, and so I, I thought, I thought that's a very good observation. All I can say is that I'm glad I gave everybody a lot to think about. I <laughs> cases six years ago. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we definitely have a lot to think about at this point. I think uh, we should call it um, thank you very much. I do see all of the folks who are the, in attendance. Many of them are my students. So thank you for uh, for coming out. Uh, I thought this was a great discussion. Thank you a lot to think about. Uh, and we will all wait with bated breath as we see which of the many different ways both of these cases might get resolved. <laughs> um, and so thanks again for your time and attention. Uh, I thought it was great. And, um, uh, you know, I'm sorry that we don't have a, a reception to feed you with. We'll virtually feed you. But <laughs> um, have a great night, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.